So starting off, uh, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Bill Pulte, Twitter philanthropist, one of the many Twitter philanthropists. We've got, I believe, 2.7 million uh, Twitter philanthropists now uh, on Twitter. So what is that? Do you want to define that for us? What's a Twitter philanthropist? Well, basically, we are people who on Twitter, we try to help other people out. And so I consider all of my followers to be Twitter philanthropists. They're part of a team. We call them teammates. And basically what happens is if there's a kid dying of cancer or if there's anybody dying of cancer, frankly, or somebody who has diabetes or recently one of the soldiers, one of the U.S. soldiers that got uh uh, killed actually in Afghanistan, we helped raise funds for the funeral for that person. So it's basically a swarm of, uh, you know, online philanthropists who get together and help people out on an as needed basis. Yeah, that sounds amazing. So does Bitcoin come into your system at all? Or what is your experience with Bitcoin? Definitely. We think that Bitcoin will in many ways reshape the way that people look at solving poverty. And what I mean by that is Twitter now with going to Lightning and Bitcoin and being able to send it very quickly, not to mention what we've been able to do with Cash App in terms of sending things electronically and some of these other super apps, so to speak. But I believe that Twitter will now enable us to reach anywhere in the globe and be able to instantly transfer value. Now that's such a big deal um, maybe not for the general commerce reasons that a lot of people use Bitcoin for on Twitter, but from a philanthropic standpoint, if you think about it, um, there are always people in life who need a hand up. And now that we can transact Bitcoin almost instantaneously, instead of people necessarily having to go to a soup kitchen or having to go uh, petition for you know, their local church to be able to get help if they're dying of cancer, for example. Bitcoin is going to enable us to seamlessly transact that to people in real time. We've already done this, by the way. But now just you know, the technology is only getting better and better. Um, so we're really excited about it. So you're stoked about the announcement today that uh, Jack Dorsey and Twitter made? <laughs> I am. I think that it's actually only, you know, uh, I think it's a long time coming. Right. And I think that there are so many other things that are going to be cascading in terms of Bitcoin's adoption. My focus is really on Bitcoin and philanthropy. And it's not something that you hear very often. I mean, you hear some some good people, um, you know, some humanitarian rights people, for example, they're pushing that. Um, and I think they're dead on because of what's happened with different currencies and whatnot. But I also really try to focus on the poverty angle and what Bitcoin will do to poverty. Have you, have you worked at all with uh, Alex Gladstein or the Human Rights Foundation? Yes, I've spoken with him. Uh, he's actually the person that I had in mind in terms of really focused on, you know, some of these third world countries and corruption of whether it be dictators or otherwise. Uh, but I think that, you know, and I talked with him recently, I know he's not necessarily focused on like inner city poverty in the United States, for example. You know, that's an area that I've really spent a lot of time focused on and, um, you know, helping people lift themselves out of poverty, even within the United States. And I think there's going to be a huge role for Bitcoin to do that in some of these inner cities across across the U.S. How does that play out in your eyes? I, I used to volunteer in a pretty run down in Albuquerque. So there's a lot of homeless there. And sure. um, we were always trying to think of ways to help these people, but it's, it's very complicated to do it uh, practically, like in the real world. So how do you think you can integrate Bitcoin to, to, to help? Well, every situation is different, right? So in many cases, you can't necessarily help people, for example, with uh, you know cancer, curing their cancer. You can't do that, right? But what you can do is you can make their battle with whatever they're going through potentially easier. And so one of the things we've done is not necessarily try to go in and fix whether it be mental health issues or whether it be you know a cancer diagnosis. But you know, for example, when people uh, you know get diagnosed with cancer, one of the things that often happens is they reach out to their family and friends. Now with the internet and with Twitter philanthropy, for example, people can tweet out, hey, I just got diagnosed with you know, stage four cancer. I'm gonna be out of a job. I can't pay for rent, can't pay for groceries. And so whether it's fiat money or Bitcoin, um, you know, you're able to use that to help uh, cushion the blow, so to speak. Now, um, 
the, the exciting thing about Bitcoin is that uh, Bitcoin is so uh, quick, it's so seamless, it's low cost, um, and there's just high fidelity with it. I mean, you just, you know, everybody knows what they're getting with it. And so I, I just think that it's, I think we're just in the first or second inning. And it's not just because lightning came out today. I would have told you this, you know, I would have told you this a year ago, you know, two years ago. That's awesome. So one of the um, tricky things about helping people, you might live in a different country from my experience. It's just, I don't necessarily inherently trust the third parties that are facilitating, you know, these philanthropic deeds. Um, so I see a potential there for you to be able to just connect Correct. sender to receiver and you can have a hands-off approach and there's no commission. There's no, there's no bite out of their pot. It just goes. Correct. You, you couldn't have said it better. So that's exactly correct. And, you know, historically in philanthropy, for example, uh, people were really focused on uh, balls and uh, events and dinners and, you know, raising all this money and doing it in a, in a, in a very overhead intensive way, right? Overhead mm -hmm. cost. What I think that Bitcoin can really help with to the extent that, you know, this can happen. And frankly, technologies like Twitter uh, is get rid of some of that overhead. I mean, you saw the other night, Elon Musk tweeted out that he was giving $50 million, granted it was fiat, to the St. Jude's Hospital, but he did it right there, boom, on Twitter. And he says, okay, this is what's happening. I'm giving this money to so-and-so. My point being is, I think that you're going to see more of a normalization. And I said this starting in 2019, and we're sitting here in 2021. I think, you know, if we revisit this in 2025, 2030, you're really going to start seeing philanthropy go online. And we're really just in 2021 on the, on the, on the cusp of really how digital some of this philanthropy will go. And to your point, it removes a lot of that organizational overhead, a lot of that corruption potentially, and other bad things that go on when there's a lot of money flowing through a lot of these philanthropic organizations. Yeah, I think the on-ramps and off-ramps to it could be strengthened so that you can verify that you're sending your funds to the right person, you know, because Bitcoin addresses Correct. are pseudonymous. I had this experience really recently, actually. We're getting a lot of media at Bitcoin Magazine from El Salvador, um, and we posted a video of a man who was selling pastries, and he had, oh. of course, a piece of paper with his lightning address on it. So we screenshotted the video, you know, and brightened his address and posted it. And people started sending him money immediately. It was amazing. Yeah, I think I watch. saw that. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. I tried it myself. Yeah. You know, it works. But there was also at the same time, a lot of, and rightfully so, a lot of commentary about, hey, you know, we trust the organization, Bitcoin Magazine, but we shouldn't have to. Like, we don't want to have to trust you guys that. You Correct. Just post some own address, and I was like, "That's a that's a fair point." I don't, you know, there needs to be. Some Ideally, I don't solution. want anyone to trust me either, right? Because yeah. eventually, basically, I've always said too with Twitter philanthropy, to the extent that it's dependent on me, it's never successful. So that's why I've been really focused on generating a movement where it inspires other people to give, and we've been able to do that. But to your point, you know, I think that Bitcoin, in many ways, is nothingness, and it's beautiful in the sense that. It removes whether it's philanthropic organizations or Twitter philanthropists like me or whatever, right? Eventually, hopefully, it becomes so seamless that you don't need all of these human beings doing all of this when you can maybe use technology for assisting their need. I don't know if that makes sense, but you, 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 for example, mentioned about the pastry. It's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. You know, somebody posted, boom, you hit them up with it. I mean, You'd never be able to do that anywhere else. And now what is he going to do with that capital? He's going to go and he's going to take that capital and he's going to reinvest, right? And ideally, or, you know, use it to do something, right? Yeah. And that's going to have all kinds camera. of ripple effects. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of angles to go here. Let's back up. A minute. So you've been, how long have you been doing Twitter uh, philanthropy for? Since June of 2019. Oh, okay. And then yeah. when did you start using Bitcoin? Uh, maybe personally and then for the Twitter philanthropy? I started using Bitcoin in about 2015, 2016. Actually, it was 2015. Oh, wow. 
yeah, I think it was 2015 was the first time I started using Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, as a believer in it, generally speaking, in fact, I think that Bitcoin probably had a pretty big influence on my ability to start Twitter philanthropy because Bitcoin, when I was seeing it in 2015, 2016, 2017, you know, you could see that the digitization of the dollar or the digitization of currency was going to be coming. And how Twitter philanthropy came to me was I was sitting around one afternoon and I decided, you know, hmm, it'd be kind of interesting if you could use uh, Twitter uh, or social media for something good instead of, you know, you know, just you see all this hate everywhere across social media. It's, it's insane. And so I said, well, why don't I put out a tweet? I'll give out $10,000. This was before I started giving away Bitcoin. I'll give away $10,000 to whatever charity can show that it needs the, the most need. And this charity came up and it was a veterans organization and boom, the tweet went viral. And from there, Twitter philanthropy was born. And then I started really giving out Bitcoin and then Cash App, you know, much like with the lightning news today with, uh, you know, on Twitter, Cash App started being able to transact Bitcoin between wallets and stuff like that. And I was one of the first testers of that. So I could just really see where this thing was going. And so I'm just trying to really lean into it because the quicker we can get it to some of these third world countries and frankly, even poverty within the United States, I think the quicker and faster it will help people. Yeah, totally agree. Um, and you're, you're seeing the remittance costs in many African countries, uh, specifically Nigeria, but also in El Salvador, of course, just get cut down. And uh, on first glance, that statistic might look as if, oh, they need fewer remittances. But what it really is, is people have to send less money to get more money over. They're not getting a huge chunk of their, of their funds taken by Wells Fargo. <laughs> um, yeah, it's so, a big deal. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. And, and you, especially during, you know, a pandemic, what's it been like for you to facilitate this remotely? Are you still on the ground? What are, how does that work? Yeah, it's a great question. So much like Bitcoin, we try to be decentralized. So it doesn't matter where I am or where all of these other, I call them teammates are, you know, these 2.7 million teammates, they can be anywhere. And that's the beauty of what we're doing. We're trying to be a deep, we are being a decentralized movement. Uh, we had a huge, very popular thing that was done. And I say popular in, you know, traditional sense of people tweeted about it. It became the number one uh, hashtag on Twitter. It was called bailout humans. And this was back when during the pandemic, uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, when they were bailing out corporations, so to speak, and bailing out, you know, a lot of the rich people. And uh, the teammates and I were really saying, no, we got to bail out humans. And I actually started sending Bitcoin to people and saw how viral that went. Uh, in fact, I posted a few tweets, at, you know, throughout the pandemic saying, do people want Bitcoin or do you want fiat? And literally hundreds of thousands of people voted on this thing. And the majority said Bitcoin. And um, so, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say that after a few of these different encounters with the virality of Bitcoin, I didn't go out and buy more Bitcoin because I did, because I was seeing it in real time, how, you know, the traction was across large numbers of people. I mean, you know, I think a couple of these polls had two or 300,000 people. And so these people are all voting to want Bitcoin instead of fiat. I think that is huge. So the, the obvious question to me becomes, how do you have a set way of raising funds or where do you get the Bitcoin to give away to people? I give away um, my own money. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what I'm giving away when I give away Bitcoin, for example. Now, I will because, I, again, I, I, I really want this movement to be about uh, not one person, but about how do we create a generation of giving on social media. And so what I do often is I will post like the kid who got killed in Afghanistan. I will post his funeral costs, for example. I will donate some myself. I forget what it was, 500 or a thousand dollars or something like this. By the way, I've given out over a million dollars on social media now, um, you know, between fees, costs, expense, uh, donating it to people. Uh, thankfully, there's not been a lot of wire costs because I've been doing it all electric, you know, digitally. Um, but so I'll 
put up that campaign, for example, and then, you know, I'll fund it, you know, a little bit. But what I'm really trying to do to my point is inspire other people to give and really create this network effect for philanthropy. And we've done it thus far. I mean, you know, I put this stuff up and within minutes, people are, you know, donating to this, you know, GoFundMe, for example, you know, and I'm not running that GoFundMe. I don't run any of these GoFundMes. So Mm -hmm. I I don't, you know, I don't, I want to, help people who are in critical need who are running their own GoFundMes that appear to me to be genuine. Over time, we've got to figure out how to, how to validate people, especially when we go to transmit large quantities of Bitcoin over time, because I think that's going to be the next frontier is how do we use blockchain technology? How do we use the technology that, that is making Bitcoin so, uh, endearing to all of us to help, uh, you know, on a decentralized basis, verify people's needs. Yeah, it's a tough question too. And, and you're in the extremely difficult position of basically allocating capital towards those needs, right? So you have to determine what is a need, what need is greater than another need. And how do you navigate questions like that? Like, how do you, you have two people that are suffering from an illness, which, which is the worst illness? I mean, how do you, how do you think about stuff like that? It's tough. It's very tough. Um, but it's nowhere near as tough as having to have cancer or one of these other things. So I always keep that in mind, but it's funny. I've asked some of my friends, uh, or I've asked many of the volunteers, many of the teammates to help give away some of my money sometimes. And every time these people give away my money, whether it's fiat or Bitcoin, uh, I'd say 80% of the time I get a message back from them saying, I do not know how you do this. This is so emotionally exhausting going through and vetting and hearing of you know, people's needs and you know, deciding who gets resources and who doesn't. And um, you got to be really careful because if you don't, if you don't set up the proper mental boundaries around helping people, uh, you know, you can kind of go crazy. And so um, that's why I believe that if we can figure out a decentralized way of doing this, we can take it off of the human uh, bottleneck, so to speak, and really start to get some throughput in terms of transaction volume, you know, flowing to the right people who really need it. Yeah. So you're in a position uh, somewhat as like a capitalist in the way like you have to reallocate these resources to help the most amount of people and it seems like you've kind of open source the returns on that um so i'm wondering what you think about this process in general of like big corporations forming and capital accumulation you know what i mean just traditional economics and centralized institutions emerging from these sort of closed markets and then the then then you can speak to the open markets that bitcoin incentivizes well capitalism today's day and age is a very loaded term and you know the the issue that i see with you know branding all corporations as capitalist is that a lot of these corporations in my opinion are committing you know crony capitalism which is you know the worst part of ca- capitalism i mean uh, if it, if you even want to call that part of capitalism I don't even really look at what I'm doing so much as capitalism as much as it is, uh, you know, I've been able to in the private sector have been able to figure out how to to, uh, take what people need and what they want and be able to give it to them, right? And that you could argue is capitalism. Um, In this situation, it's not all too different in the sense that there are people who need and there are people who want. And what we try to do with Twitter philanthropy is triage those who are in most critical need. And so, um, you know, if we can use things that, you know, the private sector uses to, you know, help triage those needs, whether it's, you know, I don't even think you'd call Bitcoin necessarily the private sector, right? But uh, there are some things about Bitcoin that are very um, useful toward, you uh, towards solving those needs that people have. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but I don't, I don't necessarily think what we're doing is um, necessarily capitalism, so to speak. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to put that label on you. I'm just kind of thinking about I, the, hard, the hard decisions you have to make today. <laughs> it seems like yeah. that the, the allocation of resources to me and just coordinating all of that is, you're right, it's something that's been kind of demonized in our society. For, you know, people tend to think of this position as like a privileged class, but it's, it, it sounds like it's a lot of work to get to where you are and to build an organization like this. Well, it is, and hopefully it isn't, because at some point, hopefully we can have, uh, you know, almost to steal the Bitcoin analogy, you know, nodes, and that's how I look at it, is all these teammates, myself included, are all nodes who are, who are basically on Twitter, and we're seeing in real time different needs, and then we're popping them up, whether it's, you know, they're tweeting at me or whether they're solving it themselves, I and mean, there's this huge viral uh, community of people helping each other, sending Bitcoin, sending Cash App. I mean, two years ago, this stuff was unheard of. And so today it's, uh, you know, it's more prevalent and I think it's only going to continue. Yeah. I have, have you gotten to use the, uh, uh, tips feature of Twitter yet? Not yet. No, no, I'm looking yeah. forward to it though. Yeah. It should be turned on any day. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that should be fun. That'll make my life easier, which is not, you know, the purpose of it, but it does reduce the friction to getting people resources, which I think will be very, very helpful. Yeah, to me, it would seem that you could help more people if you could simply facilitate the transactions through Twitter. Correct. Uh, yeah, like otherwise you're going to need to, because the nice thing about, I'm sure you've used Strike is you can take it out in your own currency you don't have to you don't even have to think about bitcoin you can just you can just send them <laughs> money in whatever currency and they'll receive it in what whatever however they like yeah 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 that's a good deal so how do you go about that process now how do you how do you facilitate these transactions like what if these people have never heard of bitcoin or, or do you only send it? Well, that's Google? been an education, but I will tell you two years ago, a lot of people did not know about Bitcoin. A lot of people thought Bitcoin was a scam. But I will tell you just from anecdotal experience, which you know is not necessarily proof, but uh, just from anecdotal experience, I can tell you that uh, people now know really what Bitcoin is. And I would say 80% of people now are comfortable accepting it which is very different than two years ago. Two years ago, it was like 20%, if that, on Twitter. And again, this is all just anecdotal experience as it relates to Bitcoin and usage of it amongst you know, mobile users um, for purposes of what we're doing. But historically, they put up their cash app, uh, you know, some people put up Bitcoin addresses, but I think that that pretty much on the Twitter flat platform, because there were so many scans and frauds and those type of things, you shied away from that. That's why having this button, so to speak, or the ability to, you know, go onto somebody's profile, I think will just make it so much more frictionless. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited about it. Yeah. Do you, do you have any kind of like education in place or do you leave it totally up to the recipient how and why to use the Bitcoin? Like, do you incentivize them to self-custody it or to use an exchange or is there any um, education there? I've just pretty much used it through Cash App now. I think as, and I try to do my, you know, as much as I can educating people on it and, uh, you know, not your keys, not your coins, you know, those type mm -hmm. of things. But I think that as people get more and more educated, as I mentioned, 20% of people were fine accepting Bitcoin two years ago, maybe even less. And today I would say 80 plus percent people are fine taking Bitcoin. I mean, I know it sounds crazy that people weren't willing to take it two years ago, but it's just, I mean, again, anecdotally, it's true because people thought, oh, you know, are you going to do something to scam me or something like that? And so, so anyway, yeah. So, so it's been through Cash App and, you know, we'll see what happens in the future. So, you know, I got every, every exchange is trying to get me to push their thing and whatnot. My, my focus is really on, you know, on, on getting, uh, Bitcoin adoption more than anything else. And Cash App has been the most seamless just from a user standpoint. I found that too. I mean, it, 
it was odd to me at first, but then you kind of watched Jack Dorsey over any period of time and you realize, you know, this, this guy's for real. He, he really means well for the world and he, he appears to mean well and want um, Bitcoin only to be adopted, you know? It's a great Bitcoin only exchange. I mean, they have stocks on the platform, but I love Cash Up. <laughs> Yeah, and it was the easiest, you know, people early on. I mean, I've had, I've done things with Coinbase, with Cash App, um, but it was the easiest to use. And, you know, that's what general people want, right? So if you have cancer and you need groceries, you don't give a shit. You just, you want the money. Get, you know, give me the grocery money. Is there a point where, I mean, is it kind of like a one time thing, or how do you decide when someone has received? enough resources obviously you could expend endless resources on any given person so how do you how do you make that cut it's very difficult we we have a 501c3 called team giving which is run by a team uh, that i interface with and they're constantly vetting people they have a certain criteria they have a checklist you know you can formally apply at teamgiving.com um and you know so we do go through those things in terms of me giving away my own money I wouldn't say I'm um, very lenient because I'm not, but I'm, I'm more trusting than not. And what I mean by that is if I, have to, if I can help 80% of people and 20% of them are scams, hypothetically, or let's say, it's, I think it's way less than that. Let's say 10% of them are scams, 90% of them are people who need help. I'll take those odds all day long. Because if I go and I give it to, you know, some centralized charity organization, for example, how do I know that my intent is really going to hit the, the, the recipient's bank account? Whereas with Twitter philanthropy, if I can give money and then boom, have it go to somebody's bank account in the year 2021 or certainly back in 2019, that was a big, big deal. And so that's really what I think is the future. And I think that's why Twitter philanthropy has gone so viral. Um, you know, one of the things, and I should mention this, is a lot of people think that a lot of my followers or a lot of my teammates on this team are people who just need money. Uh, it's actually ironic in the sense that I would say the majority of people are either there to learn how to um, become wealthy themselves or to help other people. In fact, every time, and it may sound crazy that that's the case, but every time that I give money to people, or not every time, but a lot of the time, they want to then give it to other people. It's the weirdest phenomenon in the, in the entire world. Um, and people are all the time donating to other people inside of my feed. I'm not even a part of it. And mm. so it's just, it's, as you can tell, I'm pretty excited about it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I experienced that. Not online. Well, yeah, both. Uh, volunteering in person can be really fun, right? Like you get yes. a whole bunch of people to show up. And if you show up, you know, like 10 strangers, even you're probably going to all be friends by the end of the day. You know, there is something just like nice about it. It just feels good. Uh, online, I've noticed that, as you said, it, it trends. Like after the first person, second, third person starts giving, people kind of see that socially, that cue. And then, you know, before you know it, you've really helped a lot of people. A lot. And to your point, you know, it helps. It's very nice to be able to volunteer in person because you can see that immediate thing. One of the things that's, you know, for example, very exciting is when we're able to help people get teeth. I know that sounds crazy, but it's so true. A lot of people do not have teeth in, in our country and frankly, globally, uh, or they're missing teeth. OK, and one of the things with Twitter that's beautiful is somebody can tweet out a video of their teeth, for example. And I, I can't tell you how many people I've given money to to be able, or Bitcoin to to be able to. Um, it's been mostly money, but uh, to, to get new teeth. Now, maybe over time, too, especially as we get towards third world countries and, and Bitcoin gets more adoption, you know, Bitcoin will pay for teeth. I mean, how about that? I mean, you know, that's 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 pretty rewarding stuff to see somebody who I mean, think about just from a social setting, you know, not being able to go out and not have teeth or be having missing teeth. And then, boom, you meet some guy on Twitter and all of a sudden you have teeth. I mean, that changes your physical world in 
two seconds, right? Yeah. Uh, did, have you seen, um, um, I think the account is something like BTC Smiles. Do you, do you know this uh, organization? Uh, I actually think I just followed them a few weeks ago. So I'm looking forward to seeing their work. Yeah, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, it started, I think one of my friends, like somebody on Bitcoin Magazine posted some Bitcoin address to somebody in El Salvador. And then somehow this whole Salvadoran giving and buying teeth for people uh, with Bitcoin things started. I don't know, but it's it's amazing. Wow. It's helped a lot of people. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, maybe you could hook me up with them, and and or I I can send them a DM. I think they might even follow yeah. me or something. I don't know. I I know I follow them. I think I do. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Um. So what other kinds of things do you guys do? Uh, like what other ways do you do you give? What kind of people are you looking for? Well, we um, not too long ago helped a seven-year-old girl's family pay for her funeral in Detroit because she was riding a bike in Detroit and was mauled by a dog to death. So we helped pay for her funeral. But these are just the many types of examples that Twitter philanthropy, you know, will see on an organic basis. Somebody tweets it at me and then boom, I put it on my feed and then boom, it's out there and then boom, it's fundraise and boom. You know, we can't stop the dogs from mauling somebody in that case. Horrific, horrific case. But we can mobilize people that maybe, well, in that case, for sure, weren't available to the family, but for this technology and Twitter philanthropy. I'd imagine you probably have to stay pretty apolitical as an organization. Like, how do you, how do you balance that with some of the, I mean, what I would say are like humanitarian crises is happening around the world in Australia these, I won't call out a particular group, but there's definitely some conflicts that have emerged because of political struggles that, that were not there uh, in the last two years. So how do you, how do you navigate those waters? You just too clear. We just really focused on the need. And I know that sounds kind of um, trite, but it's very true. So for example, if somebody, um, you know, is again, you know, somebody is really, really in need, um, you know, we try to focus on things that, or at least I try to focus on things that are often outside of their control. Um, and that helps get away from some of the political stuff too, because, you know, people, even though they can get themselves in bad situations, sometimes, you know, it's either politically motivated or what have you. Um, and again, that's not in all cases, but again, somebody doesn't wake up in the morning and decide to have cancer. All right. So, um, you know, that is, or, or not have teeth. Now you can do some things to lead to teeth. Right. And so, you know, we try to not, you know, say, Oh, you know, what were all your decisions and whatnot. If it's, if at this juncture in time, it's out of their control, we tried to be, you know, focused on the need and blind to the other stuff. So, mm -hmm. so how do you, is there, any process or thinking around people with um, severe mental illnesses or addictions? How do you deal with delicate populations and giving them money for which, I mean, I doubt, it doesn't sound like you're the kind of person that's gonna police how they use that money. So how do you? You know, it's a good question. You know, we don't know what people are suffering with from an abuse standpoint, from a, you know, whether it's, what, whatever toxin it is, we don't know. Uh, for instance, you could be struggling from some substance abuse problem. You know, I mean, anybody could. So, you know, what we, what we don't see is what they do behind closed doors. So it's, it's impossible to police, nor would we ever police it. Again, I get back to the, you know, the chronic needs, the chronic problems. Um, you know, if somebody needs food, for example, you know, do we fully understand whether or not that person has substance abuse? Well, many times people have substance abuse. Some of their closest friends don't even know that they have it. So, you know, I don't think that we can say, oh, we don't, we don't help people who, you know, are, you know, 
have substance abuse problems. I mean, we don't know what battles people are going through. We deal with what information we have. And as I said, if it helps 90% of the people and 10% of the people are, are not people who are, um, you know, maybe as in need as the others, uh, to put it nicely, um, you know, we'll take those odds. I mean, because you know, that's, that's, that's something that every charity goes through. Now, in our case, we happen to see it more because we're dealing with more people very quickly because that's the nature of technology. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's, that's existent every day in, in charitable life and stuff like that. And, you know, I think a charity is lying if they're saying that, you know, they can know what every person is doing behind closed doors, you know, who may or may not ever have had a substance abuse. I mean, I, I, I think anybody who thinks that is kind of kidding themselves, frankly, but that's yeah. just my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree with you. What, um, is there any um, religious or philosophical kind of like teachings behind your organization or to it, or are you guys kind of agnostic or how does that work? So we do have the 501c3, which is an organization. Um, frankly, it's centralized, but it's actually decentralized in the sense that we leverage volunteers to help vet the stuff. But when you say organization in terms of Twitter philanthropy, to me, it's a really decentralized organization. And I think that that's the beauty of it is, you know, people can come and go as they please and they don't have to be a part of it. And, you know, uh, they don't have to donate. I mean, frankly, they can just even retweet us. That's very helpful to get the message out of whatever particular person is going through a need. But uh, just from a basic standpoint, you know, we don't see any issue as it pertains to, uh, you know, anybody's particular religion, uh, creed, anything like that. Everybody, uh, you know, comes at this wanting to help other people from different areas. I happen to believe in God. I happen to believe that, um, uh, you know, a lot of this technological advancement is way beyond our human comprehension in terms of what its next applications are. And, um, you know, but that's just my personal belief, but people come at it from every angle. That's a part of our Twitter philanthropy. Is it interesting? Atheists, non-atheists, criminals, good people, bad people, angry people. I mean, there are a lot of people that are involved with Twitter philanthropy and we're happy to have them. Yeah, Hopefully so they're ex-criminals. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a very um, broad, like shotgun strategy, but you're helping the most people. I can't see another way to reach more people faster than yeah, I haven't internet. figured it out, but if you figure it out or if any of your listeners figure it out, please let me know because I'm trying to. There's going to be a Bitcoin of philanthropy at some point. And it may even be Bitcoin. It will probably be built on Bitcoin. But um, once it's figured out, that will be very, very helpful to humanity. And Bitcoin itself may be it. But there's got to be a way to vet. And if anybody has any ideas, I'd be open to it, to vet people at large scale, large quantity, and to your point, allocate the resources as need be. Because everybody needs a hand up, right? If anybody's skeptical of philanthropy or charity, I hear a lot of what people are saying. But everybody in life needs a hand up. I don't care who you are. Every successful person needed a hand up at one point in their life. And that's really what I'm talking about when it comes to need. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's true. Even outside of financially, like you never know what kind of emotional resources people are working with. Correct. But maybe like you can finance them to go, you know, even just like do a new hobby or take or go to therapy or do something that could help fulfill them in some way. So uh, I wonder. Do you consider that when you're sending these people Bitcoin, if it's the first Bitcoin they've received or if it's any Bitcoin that they're receiving, I mean, that might be some of the only property like that they've ever owned in their, in their life. I mean, it's the only unconfiscatable thing that you can own. So it's, it's no small thing. It's not the same as sending um, cash at all in my mind. I agree. And I try to get people when I send Bitcoin to commit to hold it for a period of time. You know, 
outside of getting legalistic, for example, I haven't figured out exactly how to do that. At some point, I'll probably figure something out along those lines. But again, my focus has really been on um, getting people who need it or appear to need it, for that matter. Everybody should do their own research, by the way, on, mm -hmm. on these different people I post. But try to get people the resources that they need as quick as they can, as quick as we can. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like a time locked uh, transaction wouldn't be ideal for this because people with great need of like great urgency, uh, you know, like hodling is not for someone that only has two weeks to live. Like, <laughs> correct. Yeah. So interesting. I, what kind of things is there like a standard that you send to these people like is there any information you send with the no it's just when i do it myself when i'm giving away my own money for example you know it's just uh you know it's just an instinct that you develop and i'm sure anybody who's giving away money to anybody or even on twitter you know you tend to be able to figure out if somebody you know Again, it's that 90 to 10% rule, right? So if you hit 90% of people who are, you know, can actually use your resources versus the 10% who maybe don't, you take those odds every day, or at least I do, you know? Yeah, the 90 to 10 is an interesting rule. I used to work at a, um, at a grocery store that had that built into their model. Um, and so rather than approach people who were stealing, we just said, hey, they clearly need it. You know, no non-desperate person is like stealing produce. So let them walk away with it uh, rather than make everyone feel as if they're being policed and questioned and have a security guard and have security cameras. So I really like this kind of open, open system that you have. Yes. And, you know, be ideal if there wasn't any of that, but I think that's human nature. You're always going to have that. Oh yeah. I was going to ask you about El Salvador. Do you see needs popping up in specific geographic locations or is everything all over the place all the time? It's like a virus. I shouldn't use that analogy, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's like these days I shouldn't use it, but it's like a virus, uh, Bitcoin across the, third world and other countries where there is significant amounts of poverty. It is like a virus and it is math. Bitcoin is math. So from my perspective, you know, philanthropically being able to help people with poverty, I rather take the side of math than, you know, some third world dictator who, uh, you know, doesn't give a shit if, xyz human being you know dies of you know no food or currency debasement or those type of things so i literally think we're going to be in the golden age of bitcoin philanthropy the next 10 years i think it's going to be just i think bitcoin is going to take the globe by storm from a philanthropic and poverty basis i agree with you only because like uh I guess anecdotally, it's awfully hard to give anything away when you don't have anything. And I didn't like a lot of newer Bitcoiners, I couldn't acquire any property to give away. Like it's impossible to save in this country uh, unless you know, you're some kind of expert at capital accumulation or you've already run a business. Uh, it's really hard for young people to save. I agree. Do you, do you, is there a is there a like an age you see? Do you keep any uh, stats of the people you give to? You... I'm sure we have them somewhere, but not off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would just be interesting to see where the need falls. That's a good idea. Yeah, or just like age group wise, I'm just I'm just wondering where, you know, what's what's happening in the world. Is there any last thoughts you have about Bitcoin? Bitcoin philanthropy? No, I just say we're one very small piece of this whole thing. So uh, anybody and everybody who wants to come and you know help people, just log on to Twitter. You don't even have to be a part of what we're doing. You don't even have to follow me. Uh, again, we're one small little piece of this. 
So my hat off to everybody, yourself included, who's who's making this happen globally. It's it's very exciting, and you know, we're we're pleased to be playing. You know, the smallest little fraction of it. So thanks for having me. Yep.